In this video, I will explain how and why mass murderers and Nazi collaborators were given refuge in Britain by the Labour Party Attlee government of 1945 to 1951. My source is a very good book, Justice Delayed, How Britain Became a Refuge for Nazi War Criminals by Professor David Cesarani, who was a former researcher for the All-Party Parliamentary War Crimes Group. He was also the Director of Studies at the Institute of Contemporary History and the Wiener Library, who has written on Anglo-Jewish history and the history of Zionism. Sadly, he died in 2015. East European collaborators in specially created Waffen-SS divisions assisted propping up the Nazi war machine during the Second World War and participated in the Holocaust. After the war, these men fled to the West, where, amidst the ruins of Germany, they became displaced persons, thousands of whom were brought to the UK to work in undermanned industries as part of the European Voluntary Worker Programme. The Attlee government put economic and political imperatives before security and actually favoured East Europeans over non-white immigrants and Jewish Holocaust survivors. Despite protests by the MPs Dick Crossman and Tom Dryberg, former members of the Waffen-SS and Nazi police units made new lives in Britain. British intelligence also recruited agents from among these men and sent many to the Eastern Bloc. The settlement of East Europeans in Britain after 1945 is an often forgotten part of history. It had been Hitler's intention to occupy the countries to the east of Germany as Lebensraum, living space for the so-called Aryan Master Race. The Nazis' genocidal policy for Jewish people was put into operation. Among the East European immigrants beginning a new life in Britain were thousands who had collaborated with the Nazis to various degrees. Many had worn German uniforms to fight against the USSR, their traditional enemy. Along with nationalism, there were also currents of anti-communism and sometimes an affinity with Nazi ideology. Some had volunteered to fight with the Germans, others were offered a cruel choice between working Germany or joining the army. Many entered the German forces after a career in the local police or militia, and amongst these were men who had joined the lethal onslaught against Jewish people. The Third Reich's attempt to exterminate Jewish people and other minorities was dependent on cooperation and collaboration of non-Germans. Indeed, the use of non-Germans in the military, paramilitary and rear area support units probably helped the German Reich to shore up its eastern front after the disastrous defeat at Stalingrad in the winter of 1942 and stave off defeat for another two years. Nor could the extermination of millions of Jewish people have been achieved so completely and quickly without local assistance. The participation of East Europeans in the extermination of European Jews started with the local response to the murder squads that tore through the Jewish population of Eastern Europe in the summer and autumn of 1941. This genocidal cooperation manifested partly out of the long history of contacts between German military intelligence and dissident nationalists in Poland and the USSR before the war. Military collaboration culminated in the creation of the Eastern Waffen SS. Several whole divisions comprised of Baltic, Ukrainian and White Russian volunteers. These divisions were replenished from units that had early on assisted the murder squads or guarded the death camps and the ghettos. Hitler's war that he launched against the USSR on the 22nd of June 1941 was an ideological war, the climax of his anti-Bolshevik crusade and the means by which he intended to put his racial theory into practice. It was to be a war of extermination against so-called communism, a political system and creed he considered to be synonymous with Jewish people. Hitler entrusted its implementation to Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, in a directive of 13th of March 1941. This was the starting point for the work of the Einsatzgruppen, the task force that were to carry out the destruction of communist power. The Nazis equated the Jewish people with communism, but the so-called Jewish Bolshevik intelligentsia was not mentioned explicitly until late June 1941. Within a couple of months, this category was expanded to include all Jewish people, Jewish commissars, soldiers, civilians, men, women and children. <laughs> 
The Einsatzgruppen faced a daunting task. There was a pretty large amount of Jewish people in the Baltic areas, Poland, Soviet-occupied Romania, and the pre-1939 boundaries of the USSR. They had only 3,000 personnel. Given the small numbers of the Einsatzgruppen and the enormity of their objectives in a vast land that was strange to them, the assistance of local people would be crucial. The effects of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the repressive Stalinist occupation of the new territories of the USSR, was manipulated by the Nazis to deepen the gulf between Jews and non-Jews. When the Germans arrived in these places, they were welcomed as so-called liberators, and their anti-Jewish and anti-communist propaganda was also broadly welcomed. Massacres and pogroms ensued, though there were some instances of Jewish people being spared or assisted by people who sympathised with them. Later on in the war, when the Red Army and the Allies advanced, the East European collaborators ended up in more western parts of Europe. When the Third Reich was finally defeated, the victorious Allies were amazed to find it was awash with a displaced non-German population. These men managed to masquerade as displaced persons. In Britain, the Labour Party came to power after the general election of July 1945 and Britain was exhausted with a depleted economy. Much debt had been amassed to finance the war effort and much had been spent on overseas investment. There was large losses of shipping, twice as much than that in destroyed property from enemy action. Overseas trade had been sacrificed to military needs, so much that exports shrunk to a third of their 1939 level. Production of coal was very low. It was felt that economic recovery was very much needed and it was felt that this was hampered by millions of men and women still being in the armed forces, munitions industries and logistical support. The economic survey for 1947 suggested that, quote, foreign labour can make a useful contribution to our needs, end quote. And Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee had set up the Cabinet Foreign Labour Committee, which was to investigate the possibility of recruiting foreign workers to British heavy industry and agriculture. Because of this, schemes sprang up to bring East Europeans into Britain. There was also a vocal body of eugenicists, many of them in the Labour Party, that commonly believed that the population was shrinking in size and decreasing in quality, creating a so-called manpower gap. There was an anxiety about the size and state of the population and a fear that a shrinking population would negatively affect economic development by reducing demand. The theory was also that this diminished manpower available for the military and would impair the defence of the British Empire. Plus, the theory was also that the absence of a surplus population from the British motherland would reduce the supply of British migrants to the Dominions, weaken ties with the old country and leave Anglo-Saxon populations outnumbered by non-white people. These concerns were behind the Royal Commission of Population of 1944, part of which stated, quote, Immigration on a large scale into a fully established society like ours could only be welcomed without reserve if the immigrants were of good human stock and were not prevented by their religion or race from intermarrying with the local population and becoming merged with it, end quote. This was an openly racist formula that limited the scope of the Commonwealth to Northern, Central and Southern Europe as well as Ireland. It was notable that the report did not even mention Jewish immigrants or wartime workers from the British colonies in the West Indies, Africa or Asia as desirable additions to the British population. However, there was the idea of supplying the Commonwealth with emigrants of British origin in the hope of a dual policy of continued emigration balanced by so-called selective immigration. There was also the influential think tank Political and Economic Planning, which produced its own report which favoured immigration related to displaced persons. The authors of the reports were heavily influenced by eugenics theory and so were very selective about who they favoured to bring into the motherland. Those most prioritised were those in Polish resettlement camps, displaced persons and German prisoners of war, less so those from Italy, Greece and Ireland, who might serve as reservoirs. <laughs> 
The report also stated that, quote, the absorption of large numbers of non-white immigrants would be extremely difficult, though a comparatively small group of Indo-British origin in India and Pakistan, some of whom may prefer to come to Britain, would present no major problem, end quote. The Fabian Society very much believe this sort of thing as well, with its Population and the People, a national policy in 1945. Quote, From the population point of view, we need to encourage potential parents of healthy stock to settle in the British Isles and to discourage those we already have from leaving. End quote. They believed immigrants should be carefully selected to protect the so-called British political tradition and should be those who could adapt to the so-called British way of life. It was thought that essential demographic consideration dictated that, quote, parents of young children and potential parents, provided they are mentally and physically sound, are the most desirable, end quote. The Fabian Society concluded that, quote, men and women of European stock between the ages of 20 to 30 are the immigrants best suited to assist population policy. The utmost care should of course be taken to admit only those physically and mentally sound and of free criminal records, who will introduce sound stock into the country. The eugenics of immigration cannot be overstressed. End quote. The leadership of the Labour Party of this time imbibed so-called progressive eugenics theory tinged with social Darwinism in their youth at the turn of the century and during the start of their political careers. Beveridge and Keynes, two of their great influences, had long been associated with these ideas and the MP Eleanor Rathbone was also a prominent believer. These ideas came from eugenicists like Carl Pearson and Cyril Burt. This background to the policy of recruiting overseas labour was full of racist assumptions about so-called good human stock and ultimately it would benefit people from the Baltics, Ukrainians and ethnic Germans over Jewish people, black people and Asians who were seen as unwanted um, and a problem. It is po- Impossible not to conclude that racism was at work, dressed up in the rhetoric of so-called progressive eugenics. The decision was made to recruit overseas labour from among displaced persons and bring them to Britain, people who were until recently in the Baltic Waffen SS. The question of who these people were and where they came from should have been critical, and ignorance of the war history of these men is not a reason. Enough was indeed known about them and what they had done. In Germany, where these men were selected, and in England, it was apparent that people who had served in the Waffen-SS were recruited without proper screening, with cautiousness thrown out the window, and the consequences hidden from public view. Canty Cooper and Sue Ryder knew of the fact of bringing in overseas labour to Britain and were involved in the selective process of these people in Germany, including women from the Baltic region. The Balts made a good impression on Cooper as they did on many other British observers. Cooper wrote in her memoirs that, quote, they were enemies of our ally Russia and collaborators with our enemy Germany. Some of their men had joined the German army. End quote. According to Canty Cooper, quote, the medicals necessary for the schemes revealed bolts who had been in the SS, the telltale blood group tattooed under their arms. I received last minute confessions from displaced persons about to emigrate they had registered under false names. End quote. Such deception was happening on a large scale and was of no concern to British officials. Cooper herself was not troubled by this, but only the possible loss of identity and psychological effect of these lies on the deceivers and those they misled. She was not troubled by the fact of thousands of former Waffen SS soldiers being shipped to Britain and allowed to set up new homes here. Sue Ryder, later Baroness Ryder, was another relief worker in Germany. In a debate on the war crimes bill in the House of Lords in 1990, she recalled, Quote, 
During my relief work in Europe in 1945 to 1946, I witnessed the tattoo marks under the armpits of several non-Germans who had recently been recruited by the SS were erased prior to them being examined for emigration to Britain under the Westwood Ho work scheme. Hardly any screenings occurred. End quote. The labour recruitment schemes were rushed into operation with little thought for the mechanics of security screening. They were propelled by a perceived urgency to gain overseas labour. Doctors in hostels who examined Latvian men coming off the boats from Cuxhaven also noted the characteristic Waffen-SS tattoos under the left arm. This was noticed by a medical officer at Hans Crescent Hotel in London who happened to be a Pole. Poles were especially sensitive to the havoc caused by the Waffen SS, which played a brutal part in the suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1944. When noticing the telltale marking, the medical officer began questioning the men. The Latvians were alarmed by this and protested. The Daily Graphic got hold of the story as well. The matter was taken to the Foreign Office. It was claimed that these men were, quote, in the Latvian Legion and fought with valour against the Bolshevists, not fighting for Germany and the Nazi cause, end quote. This was a highly selective and coloured account and failed to note that the Latvian Legion had come out of the Latvian police battalions that had participated in massacres of Jewish people. The core of the Latvian Waffen SS were not forced to join. The Latvian Waffen SS also defended Pomerania, and it is a fact that the fanatical 15th Waffen SS Latvian Division participated in the defence of Berlin. In the Riccioni and Romini areas of Italy at the end of the Second World War, there were several POW camps where thousands of Germans, Yugoslavs, Russians, and Ukrainians resided in Nissen huts. Prisoners often worked outside the camp and many formed relationships with Italian women and married them. It was quite common for them to start families in the huts. Up to June 1946, the Foreign Office had stuck firmly to the terms of the Yalta Agreement, allowing Soviet repatriation missions to scour POW and displacement persons camps to identify their citizens. This succeeded in persuading the majority of these people to return home voluntarily, but those who would not do so by choice or were known as collaborators were repatriated by force. This became so controversial and the British abandoned forced repatriation. The beneficiaries of this were 9,000 Ukrainians of the 14th Waffen-SS Galician Division. These men had been at um, the Riccioni and Romini area since 1945, but it's a mystery how they ended up there. According to the most authoritative account, though, British field commanders in southern Austria claimed they thought they were Polish or of an indeterminate nationality and allowed the division to travel from Klagenfurt to the Adriatic coast, where they surrendered and reported to a POW camp. They surrendered intact and remained in their regimental formations with their officers and NCOs. Ukrainian Orthodox priests led services in the camp quad every Sunday and there was even a pr primitively constructed church, a hut adorned with a cross. Around the camp and inside its ill-guarded perimeter, hundreds of Ukrainian women joined their men as well as the Italian women who had married Ukrainians and moved into the barracks with their husbands. Support and supplies were sent from Ukrainians from all over the world and Ukrainian lobbyists pleaded with letters and petitions to the British government that these people should be protected. Archbishop Ivan Butchko of the Vatican tried to persuade the British representatives to the Vatican, Sir Darcy Osborne, the Ukrainian Socialist Party addressed Clement Attlee, Ukrainians from Brazil and Canada made their voices heard, and Richard Stokes, a right-wing Catholic Labour MP from Ipswich, and a firm anti-communist, supported this lobbying effort as well as the Quakers. It wasn't long before ideas of what to do with this fully intact Waffen-SS division were proposed by Gordon R. Bowden Panchuk, head of the Central Ukrainian Relief Bureau in London and later on to become the president of the leading Ukrainian lobbyists in the UK, the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain. 
One idea proposed to the Foreign Office was to enlist the collaborators into a British Foreign Legion to defend British areas from Communist takeovers, which was a concern of the British government at the time. The Ukrainians were die-hard anti-communists, and the British had already armed, surrendered Japanese troops in Southeast Asia to suppress communist and nationalist insurrections. The other idea was to recruit these collaborators to work on British farms and in industries. According to Brigadier Fitzroy McLean, the camp at Romini was organised by the Ukrainians on politico-military lines under a fanatical Ukrainian nationalist leader, most likely Pavlo Shandruk, who had served with Skoropadsky, the leader of the short-lived German puppet republic of Ukraine in 1918. At the camp, the men freely displayed Ukrainian nationalist flags and badges. McLean also stated that those interrogated freely admitted that they had volunteered to fight for the Germans and that there were indications some may have served in SS units. The Special Refugee Screening Commission concluded that regarding these Ukrainians, quote, the great majority of them voluntarily enlisted in the German armed forces and fought against our allies. There were therefore grounds for classifying them as traitors. End quote. This was ignored by Foreign Office officials who were complicit in concealing probable war criminals, such as eight men alleged to have been war criminals by the USSR who had managed to escape and make their way to Canada and Argentina. Panchuk admitted to CRA Ray that he had personally seen them off to Canada. In April 1948, Frank Savory told a colleague in the Foreign Office that, that at a re recent meeting of the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, their representatives were heard boasting of the organisation's expansion due to the membership of men discharged from the SS Galician Division. A.W.H. Wilkinson then rushed to defuse Savory's anxiety, serving up a mixture of half-truths to the effect that not all the men were Waffen SS and suggesting that not all of them would be civilianized. He also noted that the Ukrainians should be more discreet. In light of the McLean report, officials should have been aware that it was likely that there were Nazi collaborators and mass murderers among the men of the Ukrainian division and from the moment these men were discharged as POWs, veterans of the Galician Division gathered together and celebrated their wartime exploits in Waffen-SS uniforms. During the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the emigre communities in Yorkshire were a hotbed of anti-communist politics and a power base for the virulently right-wing anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, the ABN. The ABN was led by members of the pro-Nazi regime that held, pe held power briefly in Lvov in June 1941, who still held fascist views 30 years on. Local Ukrainians even persuaded the Provost of Bradford to unveil a plaque in Bradford Cathedral in honour of the work of the ABN. Large screenings of 200,000 refugees, displaced persons and immigrant workers who had come to Britain from 1945 to 1950 were in fact more concerned to weed out communists. There is evidence that when interviewees admitted to wartime membership of pro-Nazi collaborationist units, their potentially incriminating statements were glossed over. The questionnaires used in Operation Post Report, which may have provided essential evidence for tracking down war criminals in Britain, were filed away and forgotten for 40 years. The transportation of the 14th Waffen SS Galician Division to Britain in May 1947 was not a covert operation, but the division's history was sanitised and efforts were made to minimise its public profile. Parliamentary questions were deflected and protests from other departments of state were neutralised by the use of selective and misleading information. Even if the Soviet claims that the unit consisted of war criminals was flimsy, no real effort was made to check them. The caveats in the various screening reports were overlooked, while the reservations of the Home Office were brushed aside. The frequent suspicions regarding the division and the men in it were not followed up. Responsibility for this negligence primarily lay with the Foreign Office.
If the reasons for the importation of the 14th Waffen SS Division were purely political and humanitarian, as it was claimed, why was it necessary to go to such length to mislead MPs and the public and do so much to play down the fact that they were in the UK? The later on emerging history of the Cold War, based on declassified US documents and fragmentary material that has survived, suggests the disturbing possibility that the needs of British intelligence played at least some part in saving those in the Ukrainian division. By the time the European Voluntary Worker Programme had been wound up in 1949, it had served as a channel through which at least 10,000 former Waffen-SS soldiers had been brought to Britain. This was not the result of an oversight or an accident. The relevant government departments and their political masters knew exactly what was going on. At best, obfuscation was employed, or at worst, there was a cover-up indicating unease in Whitehall. This may be explained simply by reference to the fear of upsetting public opinion, but there is another dimension to this reticence accompanying the arrival of Nazi collaborators in post-war Britain, the use to which some of these men were put in the service of military intelligence during the first rounds of the Cold War. The post-war Attlee-led Labour government was firmly anti-communist and Clement Attlee, Ernest Bevin and Hugh Dalton did not need any instruction in this regard. They had already fought communist entryism in the Labour Party and trade unions during the interwar years and had become familiar with the instruments and goals of the foreign policy of the USSR via the international bodies to which the party was affiliated. By contrast, the indifference of the Americans at the time displayed towards Russia at the 1945 Potsdam Conference irritated Attlee. He remarked in his memoirs, Quote, we were also acutely aware of the combination of Russian old-time and communist modern imperialism which threatened the freedom of Europe. I thought that the Americans had an insufficient appreciation of this danger and indeed of the whole of the European situation. By July 1945, the Post-Hostilities Planning Subcommittee, which combined War Office and the Foreign Office officials and the Chiefs of Staff, had unambiguously identified Russia as the object of British defence planning. Later on, Christopher Wren circulated a memorandum entitled The Soviet Campaign Against This Country and Our Response to It and it became British policy to build up Germany as a potential ally against Russia and to try to maintain the strategic border with Russia as far to the east as possible. Military and diplomatic thinking coalesced. Under the direction of the newly created Ministry of Defence, a strategy for withstanding Russian aggression began to emerge. The Foreign Office paper, Strategic Aspect of British Foreign Policy, issued in October 1946, advocated a state of armed preparedness and alertness against Russian pressure. The Foreign Office experts reviewed techniques of Soviet expansionism and specifically drew attention to the threat of communist fifth columns in countries such as Italy. While it held that little could be done to states that had fallen under the sway of the Red Army, it argued that it was vital to prevent others succumbing to communist domination. To this end, it was considered essential to support and encourage as far as we can our friends in those countries and to keep alive in them the connection with the Western democratic ideas which our policy towards them represents. The best hope of this is in Poland, since the Poles are born conspirators. End quote. This was only a short step from blunting Soviet influence in Western democratic countries to encouraging covert action in the Soviet sphere of control itself. The use of intelligence services as the tool of this policy was amplified in a memorandum on future defence policy prepared at the War Office on the orders of Field Marshal Montgomery, Chief of Imperial General Staff, in March 1947, as well as calling for, quote, active opposition to Soviet ideological expansion, especially in areas of strategic value, end quote. It defined amongst its aims the retention of efficiency, 
future defence policy was the basis for a governmentally approved anti-USSR defence strategy. The scene was set for the Cold War. British military planners were to take their cue from the establishment of the CIA in July 1947 as the instrument by which the USA intended to answer what it too saw as Soviet expansionism. Sir William Slim, Commandant of the Imperial Defence College, put it to the Chiefs of Staff that Russia was waging a war against the West which had to be countered, quote, by all possible means, end quote. Slim, seen as a hero of Burma, went far beyond political or propaganda weapons and proposed techniques, quote, should be employed to foster social unrest, end quote, in the communist bloc. The chiefs of staff concurred with this prognosis and recommended to the Cabinet Defence Committee that it was time to face the reality of a Cold War, although they recommended fighting it with political means only. That was until events in Central Europe changed people's minds. In March 1948, following the communist coup in Czechoslovakia, the chiefs of staff were clamouring for so-called special operations against communist regimes. In September 1948, the chiefs of staff advised, quote, taking all possible means short of war, not only to resist the further spread of communism, but also to weaken the Russian hold over country she now dominates, end quote. Britain was moving from a passive to an active strategy of containment in which covert action played a substantial part, ranging from interventions in the electoral politics of democratic countries with strong communist parties to encouraging internal unrest within the Soviet bloc. To begin with, British military intelligence was able to draw on pre-war anti-Soviet contacts that had been maintained despite the wartime alliance with Russia. The SIS, Secret Intelligence Service, otherwise known as MI6, had targeted Russia since the Bolshevik coup. During the early 1920s, it had established bases in the Baltic states and Scandinavian countries from which SIS personnel, disguised as passport control officers, ran agents inside the USSR. Tallinn in Estonia and Riga in Latvia were hotbeds of espionage, while British operatives in Helsinki, the Finnish capital, were even involved in cross-border operations by the anti-communist underground. SIS officers like Harry Carr, Chief of Operations in Helsinki from 1925 to 1941, formed strong links with white Russian emigres and members of the dissident nationalist organisations within the USSR. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Carr and his colleagues, Alexander McGibbon, based in Tallinn, Leslie Nicholson, who was in Riga, built up an extensive range of contacts across the Baltic republics. The director of military intelligence in Estonia, Colonel Willen Sarsen, was a particularly rich source of information for Carr, as he was for the Germans, who he was providing services for as well. Ants Oras, a genuine Anglophile, was professor of English at the Taru University in Estonia, and was also a frequent visitor to the British legation in Tallinn, where his brother worked as secretary. McGibbon had meanwhile cultivated Walter Zelinskis, a Lithuanian diplomat, and Nicholson had persuaded Robert Osis, a Latvian army officer. Harry Carr also made links with Ukrainian exiles, notably the Nazi collaborator Stefan Bandera, The Ukrainians, along with the White Russians, form the core of the Prometheus organisation, a loose alliance of anti-communist emigres and nationalists dedicated to subverting the communist regime. Originally, it was funded and directed by the French and Polish secret services, but in the 1930s, Stuart Menzies, the head of SIS, established a strong financial and political association between Prometheus plotters and British intelligence interests. Even before the Second World War was over, SIS was making use of captured Soviet soldiers who had been freed by the advancing Allied armies in the West. In 
When Na Nazi collaborators and former members of the Baltic Waffen SS sought refuge in Sweden after the collapse of the Third Reich, they were pounced on by Swedish and British military intelligence, neither of which asked too many questions about the Balts wartime activities. One of the earliest post-war recruits for SIS was the Lithuanian intellectual Stasis Zakovikius, who had served as an advisor to the Germans during the occupation. McGibbon's agents ran into him and won him over. Zakovikius changed his name to Zimantus and brought into the service of SIS Stasis Lozaritis and Jonas Dexins. They established links with anti-communist partisans in Lithuania, many of who had gone into the forests after serving the Germans in various capacities. Their ranks included former members of the Schutzpolizei, who had escorted Jewish people to the killing grounds, ringed the areas and participated in the shootings, and the short-lived Lithuanian Waffen SS. The linchpin of the Lithuanian anti-communist was General Povlius Plekovicius, who had collaborated with the German Reich in their anti-communist and anti-Semitic crusade and found himself in the British zone at the end of the war. The Soviets demanded that he be handed over as a traitor and war criminal, but this was refused. Many exiled Latvian Nazi collaborators and ex-Waffen SS men were also used as anti-Soviet operatives. This link was forged by Robert Osis, who was a Nazi collaborator who rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in their services, and he had commanded the units of the Latvian police, the Schutzpolizei and Schutzmannschaften, that had forced Jewish people to the killing site in the Rumbula forest and guarded the perimeter while massacres were carried out. This was part of the liquidation of Jewish people in the Riga ghetto between November and December 1941. Felix Rumniks, who had enlisted in the Latvian Legion, the precursor to the Latvian Waffen SS, also undertook various duties for British military intelligence. He was later arrested by the KGB. Charles Zarina, the head of the Latvian Legation, who had been such a persistent lobbyist for the Balts in the Waffen SS, also proved to be a useful assistant to the SIS in the search for agents. Zarina put British intelligence in touch with Rudolf Zelayas, a former officer in the collaborationist Latvian Air Force who was languishing in a displaced persons camp. Through Zelayas, the SIS was introduced to several other Latvian collaborators, including Witold Birkins and Andre Gladins, who trained at a specially established centre in Chelsea, London, before being sent on their missions. By now, the Westwood Ho scheme was bringing thousands of former Baltic Waffen SS men into Britain. No less than 9,706 Latvians had arrived in England by 1949, and though not all of them were ex-combatants, a large proportion of them were. So it was even easier for the SIS to recruit physically fit young men with military training and combat experience. Bolislav Pitants who had been a Latvian Waffen SS soldier, had arrived in England in 1947 as a European voluntary worker and ended up working as a baker. He was approached by the SIS for a special mission in 1950 and sent into Latvia with two Estonians who were also former members of the Waffen SS. Lodis Upans was a member of the Aryas Commando. No questions were asked about his homicidal background and former MI6 officer Anthony Cavendish has confirmed that suspicion of being a war criminal was no obstacle to the recruitment of Bolts willing to take part in clandestine operations. Cavendish ran the operation in the Baltic which was intended to infiltrate dis dissident Latvians recruited in the West from among displaced persons and former Waffen SS men back into Latvia where they would link up with anti-Soviet partisans. He told Tom Bowyer in an interview in 1989 that, quote, if somebody was needed to do a job and if he had committed war crimes, I would use him to do the job, ones I felt essential, end quote. The same pattern emerged 
With respect to special operations in Estonia, British intelligence officers plundered the human cargo brought to Britain by the European Voluntary Worker Programme and unflinchingly selected men who not only had fought for the German Reich, but had worn the uniform of the Waffen-SS. Alphonse Rabana was taken from his job in a textile mill in West Yorkshire, but in his previous career he had been a battalion commander in the 20th Waffen-SS Estonian Division. SIS could rely on its friends in the Baltic legation such as August Torma, the head of the Estonian legation, who, like Zarina, had cultivated the Foreign Office and had regularly intervened on behalf of Estonian displaced persons and former combatants. He was later to be closely associated with covert missions into Estonia. From the moment Rabana was in the pay of SIS, it was simple for them to identify dozens of Estonians seen as suitable, and the former Waffen-SS officer asked SIS to find and bring to England the former General Inspector of the Estonian Waffen-SS Division, Vaino Partel. With their combined knowledge of the unit, it was easy for them to draw up lists of its wartime complement. Then, with the assistance of the British, they tracked down the men in displaced persons camps and European voluntary worker hostels and offered them employment on special missions. In this way, numerous ex-Waffen-SS men like Leo Ordova and Mark Padek were recruited into SIS. By late 1950, no fewer than 40 volunteers had been assembled and several groups prepared for covert operations in Estonia. It appears that it made little difference to British intelligence and the Foreign Office if Bolts who offered their services for covert purposes were alleged war criminals and in March 1949 Charles Zarina wrote to J.Y. Mackenzie of the Foreign Office to enforce him that Colonel Yannams was in London on business regarding De Vargas Fanaghi, the Association of Latvian Ex-Servicemen. Yanams had been a key figure in the internal security apparatus of the collaborationist regime which had worked under the Nazis in Latvia. As chief of, chief of the personnel department of the regime's Home Affairs Committee, he had authority over all of the Latvian police units operating under the command of the German Reich. In 1943, he helped to recruit volunteers for the Latvian Legion and subsequently took command of the 33rd Regiment of the 15th Waffen SS Latvian Division. Pro Nazi and anti Soviet, Yanams had found a congenial home in Berlin while Latvia was under Soviet occupation during 1940 41. He had played absolutely no part in resisting or even questioning the aims or methods of the rule of the German Reich and had served in the ranks of the Waffen-SS to the bitter end. Dorvagis Fanaghi, the organisation he worked for after the war, originated when ex-Waffen-SS Latvians in POW camps in the USA and Britain banded together for welfare purposes and to defend themselves from USSR repatriation missions. It gradually established a firm grip over these holding centres. Another collaborator who was crucial for organising imprisoned Latvians was Dr Alfred Voldmanis, who was allowed by the British to travel freely through their zone in Germany, doing so-called welfare work amongst ex-Wehrmacht bolts. Within a short time, most of the Latvian veterans were enrolled in highly organised networks dominated by once leading members of the civil and military arms of the Quisling regime in Latvia. By 1950, the CIA was funneling money into Devargis Fanaghi, which came to serve a variety of Cold War functions. It produced much anti-communist propaganda, and more importantly, it was a source of trained manpower for use in operations in USSR-held territory. The reason for Yanams' visit to London appears to have been to develop a similar project with the British. Lieutenant Colonel Stoney of MI3 met with Yanams and later reported to Mackenzie that, quote, like most of the dispossessed bolts, I think he is hoping for a war, end quote. The Latvian colonel wanted the British army to train 150 Latvian officers in the UK and 300 in the area of the British army of the Rhine. Quote, before they get too rusty, end quote. 
Yanam specifically mentioned the hundred Latvian, um, the hundred Latvians in the CWMS, a paramilitary service set up by the British to guard military installations in the British zone in Germany. Stoney told him that he couldn't make any promises, but he did inform Mackenzie that he did get one useful piece of information from Yanams, which made things worthwhile from his point of view. There is powerful evidence to suggest that the British Army was employing former Waffen SS men in various capacities. The left wing Labour MPs Connie Zillikus and his Jewish parliamentary colleague Maurice Allback had complained about the use of bolts in exo- ex- auxiliary army units after a front page story in the New York Times drew attention to the practice in February 1946. Despite their protest, the use of former enemy soldiers was not curbed. In fact, it grew until hundreds of Baltic ex-combatants and collaborators were receiving pay by the British Army. They were employed as drivers in all Baltic transport companies, engineer units and as armed guards protecting British military installations, including such sensitive and strategically important locations as headquarters, buildings, ammunition dumps and airfields. These transport, engineer and guard companies on the surface perform mundane tasks that could have been carried out by German civilians or by British troops. So why did the army insist on what was a controversial policy? What might have been the real purpose of Baltic paramilitary formations may be inferred from the origins and career of parallel units established by the US Army. So-called labour service units, composed entirely of Latvians, Estonians and Belarusians, were created by the American forces in early 1946 and continued to exist well into the 1950s. From US Army documents declassified in the 1980s, it is now clear that they were intended as holding and training units for men destined to play a crucial role in the event of a Third World War. According to US military doctrine in the late 1940s and early 50s, there was an imminent risk of a war with the USSR which would result in an exchange of atomic weapons. The final victor would be the power that survived this exchange and was able to establish control over its enemy's territory. One means by which the US intended to accomplish this would be the insertion of special operations groups behind the lines to establish links with the anti-communist forces, which it was fervently believed would emerge to take power. Exiles from the USSR satellite countries would be perfect for this task. The labour service units were a means to recruit and train them and hold them in a state of readiness. Representatives of the emigre communities seem to have explored the same idea with British government officials on more than one occasion. In April 1948, Bowdoin Panchuk and another Ukrainian, M. Andreevsky, met with CRA Ray at the Foreign Office to discuss the formation of Ukrainian military units to serve against the USSR. Andreevsky also provided a list of Ukrainians in Germany and proposed that Britain and the USA should transfer them. The existence and presumably the purpose of these units was also known to Charles Zarina, who discussed them with Alexander McGibbon of SIS. After the outbreak of the Korean War, Zarina, like many other exiles, believed that a showdown with the USSR was imminent and that the West would wish to make use of emigres for intelligence purposes and covert actions. Since the British Army was employing Latvians and Estonians in armed formations until the late 1950s, this may not have been a fanciful notion. Covert activity sponsored by the USA, which has come to light under the Freedom of Information Act, offers a useful analogue for reconstructing the work of the British Secret Service, which by contrast have succeeded in retaining a vice-like grip on documents, critical and trivial, that offer any insight into their history. However, with the US experience, there are several well-documented cases of collaboration between the intelligence agencies of the two countries, which throw light on the role of SIS in particular. This material reveals that British intelligence protected East European Nazi war criminals and shared their services with the USA. Operation Apple Pie was devoted to securing the members of the SS head office department 
RHSA Ant-6, who were responsible for intelligence work related to the USSR. The British element of Operation Apple Pie was quite successful and so found several individuals who had worked in RHSA Ant-6, including Nikolai Popper, who was saved from investigation for collaboration and war crimes, along with whole groups of East Europeans under the authority of directives for covert action that were issued by the National Security Council in 1948 to 1950. John Loftus, a former federal prosecutor in the US, the Office of Special Investigations of the Criminal Division of the United States Justice Department, provided powerful evidence that in 1948 the OPC, under the direction of Frank Wisner, established a network of collaborators and tra transported them to the USA. Um, this was the bulk of the 30th Waffen SS Belarusian Brigade. Christopher Simpson assembled evidence that Wisner, acting as the first chief of staff of CIA clandestine operations and his colleagues in the State Department were responsible for an even more widely ramified system of recruiting CIA agents from amongst displaced East Europeans with no regard at all for the possibility or knowledge that they were war criminals. Wisner was a former member of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the US wartime intelligence agency created from scratch by General William Donovan. At the end of the war, he was involved in the covert enlistment of General Reinhard Galen in US counterintelligence work. Galen had headed the Wehrmacht's intelligence department responsible for foreign armies east and had assembled a mass of information on the Red Army in the USSR. As the Third Reich disintegrated and the US streamed all over southern Germany, Galen sent out emissaries to make contact with US military intelligence. He then traded his treasure house of information for his own security and the integrity of his entire wartime apparatus. After the OSS had been convinced that Galen could offer them a ready-made source of intelligence about the USSR behind Russian lines, Galen's outfit was simply transferred under the wing of the US Army. From 1947 onwards, Wisner was at the hub of a circle of US intelligence officers and diplomats who dealt with the USSR. They included Alan Dulles, George Kennan, Charles Thayer, and Charles Bolan, who would emerge as the architects of the USA's Cold War policy. Kennan, Thayer and Bolan had all served as young diplomats in Moscow before the war, where they had become close friends with a number of their German counterparts. Several of these men, notably Hans Johnny von Herwarth, would later be responsible for the recruitment of East Europeans into the German armed forces or play a part in intelligence operations directed against the USSR. Aware of this, the Americans made every effort to track down their former colleagues and friends. Charles Thayer launched an initiative that led to the US Army locating Hervarf, who played a leading part in organising the Ostrupen and Vlasov's so-called Russian Army of Liberation. In his memoirs, Thayer frankly confessed why he held such an interest in Hervarf, which was to find out what really happened on the Russian front from June 1941 onwards, and Hervarf was useful in this regard and provided him with a record of his wartime work, which included setting out details of the recruitment of dissident Ukrainians to fight against the USSR. So Hervarf inducted the Americans into the realm of collaboration between the Nazis and East Europeans and planted the idea, which would prove so attractive to cold warriors, that the USSR was a house of cards that could be toppled if the subject nationalities were aroused and turned against their communist masters. Hervarf also introduced the OSS to other Germans, such as Gustav Hilger, a German Foreign Office official who specialised in Russian affairs. Hilger was an expert on Russian collaboration. He had been one of the first German officials to explore the potential of General Vlasov and was heavily involved in the political aspects of raising collaborationist units for the German cause. Hilger and those like him who were taken into the service of the CIA 
was to have a major influence on shaping the USA's Cold War foreign policy and covert operations against the USSR. Subversion was one of the tasks allotted to Wisner's section of the CIA and East European emigres were to become an important tool in his armoury. Inspired by Hervarfs and Hilger's version of events inside Russia during the war, the CIA prepared to send East Europeans behind the Iron Curtain to link up with alleged anti-communist partisan, partisan movements in Ukraine and Belarus. Others were readied for the possibility of a third world war when they would function as a fifth column behind Russian lines and assist in displacing the communist administration. In pursuit of this policy, between 1947 and 1951, several groups of emigres were parachuted into Albania, Ukraine and Belarus. British military intelligence participated in these operations and utilised networks of emigre Ukrainians and Belarusians on lines similar to those used in the case of the Baltic region. Stefan Bandera and Yaroslav Stetsko were the chief links between SIS and the Ukrainian emigre movement. Bandera had been a leading Ukrainian nationalist before the Second World War and had long been associated with British military intelligence. The SIS continued to use the Ukrainian National Organization personnel after 1945, despite its intimate collaboration with the Nazis and its complicity in the massacres of Jewish people in Ukraine in 1941. The British authorities did little to curb the activities of the Ukrainian National Organization when it was using strong-arm tactics to establish its domination over Ukrainian refugees, displaced persons and ex-servicemen in the British zone of Germany. By 1950, the influence of the Ukrainian National Organization extended to the Ukrainians in Britain. Although much of the material on political activity of the Ukrainian emigres is still withheld from public view, a sufficient amount has been released to indicate that even the Foreign Office was alarmed at the rightward neo-fascist trends that became evident in British Ukrainian circles. In 1949, Ukrainian European voluntary workers felt bold enough to hold public meetings and pass resolutions in support of the aims of the anti-communist and rapidly right-wing emigre movement. Its leaders, such as Yaroslav Stetsko, who had accompanied the Nazis to Lvov in 1941 and had been at its head of the short-lived Ukrainian government, appealed to be able to travel to and from Britain with ease. Stetsko was well known to Foreign Office officials and in June 1949 even felt confident enough to ask for a private meeting with Ernest Bevin. The Ukrainians in Britain would therefore have been fertile recruiting ground for the SIS. During 1951 at least, three teams of British trained Ukrainians were parachuted into Western Ukraine. These operations were mounted in full cooperation with the CIA and align exactly with independent American activity at the same time. It's not hard to see the Waffen SS Ukraine Division um, fulfilling the same function as the Waffen SS Belarusian Brigade, which Wisner imported to the USA. Regarding the British Secret Service and the emigres, it is very likely that collaboration was not confined to the operations in the Baltic or Ukraine. The SIS also recruited Mikolai Abramchik, a member of the collaborationist Belarusian Central Council, which was assembled by the Nazis in 1943 as a device to legitimise the raising of more Belarusian volunteer units. Members of Vlasov's army also found their way into British Secret Service, such as Major Len Manderstram, an officer in the Special Operations Executive. He had been born in Riga and was in the Red Army, but became violently anti-communist, just about avoiding the executioner's squad for plotting against the Bolsheviks. He was able to escape from Russia to Latvia before going to South Africa, where he worked during the interwar period. In 1939, he volunteered for military service with the British, travelled to England and found his way into the Special Operations Executive. Through Manderstram, the Special Operations Executive was able to use 40 men from the collaborationist and anti-communist Russian Army of Liberation for covert activities against the USSR, such as the parachute drops into Ukraine. <laughs> 
The Joint Intelligence Committee, the body responsible for coordinating intelligence activities, was certainly aware of Lassavites, who had reached Britain. Beryl Hughes recalls that in 1947 or 1948, the Joint Intelligence Committee approached the Home Office Departments handling immigration affairs, seeking 200 native Russian speakers as teachers for SIS operatives. It didn't prove difficult to find candidates. The immigration officers simply went through the interviews of European voluntary workers and called in those whose place and date of birth suggested that they would be useful. In this way, more than 100 Russians were located for the war office, which ran the courses and no questions were asked about how these men got into the country or about their wartime activities. Beryl Hughes' information about the use of Vlasovites has been echoed in the case of Ukrainians by Rupert Allison MP, who told the House of Commons during a debate on the war crimes bill in March 1990 that quite a number of the Ukrainians came at the invitation of the British government and British intelligence. According to Allison, who wrote on intelligence services with the alias of Nigel West, quote, they went up to RAF Crail, then the language centre operated by most of the services. RAF Crail has now been transferred to Bodmin. The Ukrainians went to Crail and I have obtained evidence from people who served there and were taught Russian by people who openly boasted about the atrocities they had, they had committed against Jewish people in the Baltic countries during the war. Those boasts were known to British national servicemen going into the intelligence corps and they must have been known to the British government in subsequent years. End quote. Displaced persons in British camps in Europe and those brought here under the European Volunteer Workers Programmes provided a handy pool of anti-communist East European emigres just at the time when SIS was setting out on clandestine operations against the USSR. The authenticated history of the OSS and the CIA offers a parallel for the British Secret Services and helps in the interpretation of the fragmentary evidence that is available. On that basis, it is highly likely that intelligence considerations played some part in the decisions to shield East Europeans from repatriation. Although the Cold War played no part in the instigation of the European Volunteer Workers Scheme, there is little doubt that they provided a conduit through which valuable intelligence assets could be transported to Britain and resulted in the creation of emigre communities that were ripe for exploitation. In this sense, it is very likely that SIS piggybacked on the handling of the East Europeans without ever interfering directly in the matter. Given the number of exchanges between senior civil servants in the Foreign Office and officers in the intelligence divisions of Control Office in Germany and London, the War Office and the intelligence services, it's hard to believe that they didn't know what was happening. If the permanent undersecretaries in the Foreign Office were aware of the use to which POWs, displaced persons and European vol volunteer workers were being put, it is equally incredible that their political masters were unaware. Since Attlee, Bevin, Dalton and other cabinet ministers were partly party to the evolution of British policy towards Russia, this information would not have seemed unacceptable or outlandish to them. British attitudes towards East Europeans were formed within the context of the Cold War. The pursuit and prosecution of war criminals, the disdain for collaboration and the revulsion felt for the Waffen-SS were all tempered by a sense that war criminals, collaborators and ex-SS men could prove useful for the interests of the British state. In November 1960, the people of Leicester were shocked to discover that Ein Irvin Meir was subject to a war crimes investigation by the USSR. Mir had come to England probably as a European voluntary worker in 1947, where he worked as a hosiery knitter. A member of the city's small Estonian community, he lived in a, qu a quiet life there up until 1969. Mir had been a major in the Estonian army at the time of the Russian occupation in 1940 and had remained in the armed forces under Russian command until 1941 when he deserted to the Germans. After a brief period as a prisoner of war, he was sent to Tallinn as an officer in the Estonian Selbstutz, the anti-partisan self-defence corps. Then, because of his language skills, the Germans gave him the task of reorganising the Estonian police force. While he was chief of police, 
in the collaborationist Estonian regime, Mir had been in charge of all the locally recruited Hilfspolizei and Schutzmannschaften. He was responsible directly for the German Sick to Heistdienst and worked hand in glove with the SS, SD and the Gestapo. According to his accusers, he supervised the running of the Yalaga prison camp in which thousands of Jewish people and communists were executed. It was also alleged that he had personally taken part in the mass murder of Jewish people at Kalivi Liva. This was one of the notorious killing sites at which the work was done that enabled Einsatzgruppe A to boast that at the end of 1941, Estonia was truly Judenrein, meaning free of Jewish people. In April 1943, like so many collaborators and police and military units, Mir was assigned um, to the Estonian Legion. He came to Britain in 1947 and married an Estonian woman in Portsmouth before moving to Leicester. Despite the fact that he freely admitted to have been a collaborationist police chief, no steps were taken to investigate the charges against Mir or to question how a man who had voluntarily aided the enemy had managed to take up residence in a sedate suburb of Leicester. Indeed, in December 1950, the Attlee government told the UN War Crimes Commission that since the change of policy announced in 1948, it no longer felt under any obligation to deport alleged war criminals. What's more, the Attlee government also stated that it did not recognise the legality of the incorporation of Estonia into the USSR, and so there was no legal basis for proceeding. The Russians had tracked down Mir uh, many years after the British had announced that they would not accept further extradition cases. Strict application of the 1948 decision would mean that East European murderers in England would be protected from facing justice just because they had kept their heads down for long enough. Mir was eventually tried in absentia in um, Tallinn. Dozens of eyewitnesses testified to his activities in wartime Estonia and detailed evidence was provided exposing his role in the Yalak camp. In March 1961 he was sentenced to death, but this had little effect on his life in Leicester, which returned to normal. He died there in April 1969. Not long afterwards, another case of Baltic war criminals in Britain came to light as a result of investigations by the WJC, the World Jewish Congress. Jewish organisations like the Association of Baltic Jews in Great Britain had long been helping in war crimes trials such as the Riga Ghetto case in Hamburg in 1951. They had sought evidence against mass killers like Victor Aryas amongst survivors in Germany and England, but they had never before looked for the murderers on their own doorstep. Yet the WJC claimed that Vader Wittenbergs and Carlis Wittenbergs, two district chiefs in occupied Latvia, were now living in Britain. The story was reported in the Jewish Chronicle and the WJC attempted to create interest in the case, but it seems to have gone no further. Then there's the case of Paulus Reinhardt, a Minister of Labour in the collaborationist Latvian regime. He helped recruit volunteers to the Latvian Waffen SS. He later settled in Britain and died in Gravesend in Kent in 1990. Kirillo Zvaric had been a member of the Ukrainian police battalion based in Zabalotia, his home village. Eyewitnesses in the USSR who had been his neighbours told the local press that they could testify to several occasions in which he had mercilessly gunned down innocent people, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish people, in Zabalotia. Ukrainians in Britain who were aware of inquiries into his case informed the USSR authorities that Zvarich was living in Bolton, England under the name of Stanislav Piotrowski. In 1971, the Russian government instigated proceedings for his extradition. Testimonies were collected from over 70 eyewitnesses and submitted to the Foreign Office in support of the extradition demand. However, the Foreign Office, then run by the Thatcher government, didn't even bother to reply. No inquiries into the allegations were made by officials in this country at the time. In 1979, the man who commanded the unit in which Zvarich had served and two colleagues were tried in the USSR and found guilty of mass murder. In 
The investigation revealed that on the 9th of January 1943, a Ukrainian police unit had massacred over 100 Jewish people at a village called Tur. According to Kondrat Shuduk, who drove the carts laden with Jewish people to the execution site, quote, they were taken off the road and they were ordered to lay face down in the snow. If someone raised their head, they were struck with rifles and ordered not to raise their heads. And then some of them were told to get up and were forced to undress. And some were completely naked and they were taken to a pit. And some of them, because it was cold, were running into the pit. They were pushed into the pit and shot there. There was about a 100 people there and the shooting lasted about two hours. I knew Zvarich. I knew Dufinitz, the unit commander. I knew Zvarich because we were shepherds together when we were boys. End quote. Despite this, this additional evidence, in 1983 the British authorities rejected a further Russian bid to bring Zvarich to trial and he died in Bolton in 1986. But also in 1986... The Simon Wiesenthal Centre provided evidence that could not be ignored. There followed a long and tough political campaign culminating in a constitutional crisis. Eventually, this led to the War Crimes Act on the 10th of May 1991, which only applies to areas under occupation by the German Reich during the Second World War and to those who are currently British citizens or resident in the UK and proceedings can only go ahead with the approval of the Attorney General. Parliament did not do enough to bring to justice Nazi collaborators who served the interests of the British ruling class and its state. An attempt to cover up the vile truth was perpetrated for over 50 years. Mass murderers who were supposed to be enemies of Britain, who served an extreme form of totalitarian capitalism, came to the aid of British capital and the British political class, including participating in the Cold War on the side of the Western capitalist powers. Not enough people are aware of the shameful and traitorous truth. The interests of the British bourgeoisie and the Nazi and fascist bourgeoisie were essentially the same, as proved by other historical factors, such as the fact that many in the British ruling class, including the class warrior and imperialist genocidal butcher Winston Churchill and his colleagues, were demonstrably pro-fascist up until 1938 and were not generally anti-fascist during the Second World War, simply participating in that war for the interests of the British Empire and the British bourgeoisie for the dominance of markets for the benefit of British capital, rather than some so-called anti-fascist fight. This is also yet another vile and thoroughly shameful chapter in the disgusting, blood-soaked and anti-working class history of the Labour Party that should be remembered by everyone. I hope you found this video informative. Thank you for listening.